Coming up next on Heartland Highways, we'll stop by the Douglas County Museum in Tuscola, Illinois. Here, unique and rotating local exhibits have been featured for over 25 years. Then, the Museum of the Grand Prairie in Muhammad, Illinois offers a cultural connection to the Illinois land. Finally, we'll check out the Cedarhurst Center for the Arts, which offers year-round visual and performing arts for people of all ages. That's coming up next on Heartland Highways. Welcome back to another edition of Heartland Highways. This week we're taking everybody to three different museums. Now the Douglas County Museum in Tuscola, Illinois has been showcasing different displays for over 25 years. And when we were visiting there was a display with ties to Walt Disney called Everything Animation. Now in this story you'll see everything from Bugs Bunny to Garfield and Mickey Mouse just to name a few. I used to work for a local newspaper. I'm one of the founders of the museum and I used to work for a local newspaper and there were a lot of people when I went to do interviews with him who said, I don't know what's going to happen to my stuff. When I die, my kids don't care. I just don't know what's going to happen to it. And I realized that there was no place to keep those really important artifacts that tell stories of, of the life here in East Central Illinois. And I felt that there was really a need for it. Along with the two other co-founders of the museum, Lucille Murray and Rusty Hastings, Lenita Brown needed a place to call home for the Museum Association of Douglas County. This was the place that we needed to be and we got this building in 1987 and started to do the remodeling then. We were able to approach the people in the community, tell them how badly we needed a museum here and they all pitched in, started giving items uh, like desks and chairs and things like that that we knew we were going to need in the museum and, and a lot of volunteers pitched in and we cleaned up the place. Set on South Main Street in Tuscola, Illinois, the Douglas County Museum grew in the number of volunteers who had helped out. And by the end of 1992, over 500 people had helped out the museum. This museum could not have survived without the volunteers. And we have volunteers here who have literally put in thousands of hours on behalf of this museum without ever getting paid for it. So they're the ones who made it happen. We all did. All of those, those of us who have volunteered through the years were the ones who made it happen. And then the public that came in to support us financially also helped make it happen. So it really has been a joint effort between volunteers and the community. And the hard work of so many in those first few years resulted in the Albert Corey Award in 1993, a national award that awarded the Douglas County Museum for its excellence in preserving and interpreting Douglas County's history. We are known for really nice quality programs. We've had authors, we had the man that created Paint by Number has been here as a, as a program. We've had concerts and musicals and, and just nice educational programs. With the exhibits being displayed for three to four months at a time, half the year or even an entire year, Ms. Brown says there is no shortage of memories that have been generated by the collections that have donned the interior of the museum over the past 25 years. The biggest program that we ever had was when we had two survivors from Schindler's List. And we had 200 people in the audience two nights in a row listening to these really fabulous survivors telling about uh, wanting to get the word out that that the Holocaust was real even though there are those who think it wasn't and the story was amazing. In the fall of 2011 the museum opened their doors to everything animation products from animated television shows and movies such as Sesame Street and Disney will be on display through the spring of 2012. When the Douglas County Museum has an exhibit, we ask the public to bring things in to put on display on a temporary basis. And these are some of the oldest toys in here. These are uh, original Marx toys. 
that were given out at Disney World when they had openings and things like that, and there are banks up here. We tag our showcases before we actually make a regular label so we know who brought what in, and we have a lady who brought in quite a lot of Garfield this time, and we have those on display. Mickey Mouse, of course, is a favorite with a lot of people, so we have a lot of Mickey Mouse in here, and Pixar, and Disney Pixar, and, and all kinds of things, Disney in here. This particular lady likes um, the Disney villains, so we have a showcase that has a lot of the Disney vill villain items. One of the things that uh, we found out a few years ago was that two of the men who are among the most famous of the older original Disney animators, their mothers were both from Tuscola. The interesting thing about it is that neither one of their mothers knew each other when they were living in Tuscola, but they uh, grew up to marry and move out to California. And once they moved out to California, then they each had a talented son who became a Walt Disney animator and they became best friends, Frank and Ollie. Frank and Ollie uh, came up with things like the scenes with Bambi sliding on the ice in the winter time and Lady and the Tramp uh, eating uh, spaghetti on both ends of the spaghetti. Um, they also uh, they also wrote all four of the books that are in the showcase and they had a video made about their lifetime friendship live next door and both of them are now deceased but their families go back to the original settlers here in Douglas County. Last year we published what's called the Jarman Baby Book and that was the culmination of a project that lasted about 10 years of trying to find what happened, who, who were they, and what happened to all the babies that were born at the local Jarman Memorial Hospital. Well, just a wonderful project, and it's just, it was just really interesting, and we found out information about the doctors who delivered the babies, learned something about the doctors that you don't normally learn if you're just a patient. You don't know that that doctor liked the fish and that kind of thing. It's a bit like going home and uh, ha having a messy house, and you gotta clean it up, and when you get it all cleaned up, it just looks so great. It's hard work to do it, but it's but it's it's great whenever it's all done and people think your place is great. And that's the same way it is with the Douglas County Museum. When you come in here and we're between exhibits is what we call it, uh, the place looks looks pretty rough. <laughs> you know, we've got tables set up and we've got items laying on tables and we've got papers that we're cutting and scissors laying around and tape and all kinds of stuff getting ready for an exhibit. And then when we put, get it all put together and people come in and 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 they really like it and, and, and they learn something and, and we know that we've done something great as far as preserving an item that comes in and you're just amazed that that thing still exists. People who are not from around here come in and they say, gosh, we wish that our town had a museum like this. Sometimes people will call us and say, what is it that you want? And we've learned to not answer that question we say, what is it that you have? Because if we say what we want, then we will pass up those things that we didn't know that they had. There's history in everything. There really is. There's history in a Happy Meal toy. And there's history in everything that's around us. It's just a matter of not being aware that that history is there. And that's part of the job of the Douglas County Museum staff is to make the, the public be aware that there's history in everything. Now you can watch Heartland Highways online anytime. Check us out on youtube.com slash WEIUTV. Once you're there, just look for the Heartland Highways playlist, which will take you to a list of full episodes from seasons 7, 8, 9, and 10. In Muhammad, Illinois, the early American Museum changed their name to the Museum of the Grand Prairie. They wanted to reflect the way the pioneers changed the land and that the land changed the pioneers. Well, the museum was built in 1968 to house the collection of William Redhead. He had about 3,000 pieces that represented early American life on the prairie, and they were all placed in glass display cases for people to see when they came to visit the museum. Perfect for the time period, told the story as he wanted the story to be told, but very different from the museum that you see today. What you see today is the Museum of the Grand Prairie, a sprawling collection of displays and artifacts from before Americans came to Illinois through the 20th century. 
The museum has been around, but it was called the Early American Museum. Why the name change? Well, it was named Early American Museum because the collection represented early American life. And so that was a natural title. And in all the years uh, that I've been here, you know, and I travel outside of Champaign County, people would say, well, early American, isn't that colonial history? Why would you have a colonial history museum, you know, here in Illinois? And of course, early American can be many things depending upon where you are in the country. And where these early Americans found themselves was on the edge of a sea of prairie, far different from anything many of them had ever experienced. It was this meeting of two strong forces, each acting on the other. To a story of place. And so we're looking at this landscape that man arrived in. What did it look like? How did it come to be what it was when the first settlers came here? And how has it evolved since then? What's the impact of man on his environment and the environment on man? The effect on man was profound. Well, I'm telling him, just about everyone who came here uh, initially saw the prairie as nearly like a desert, because although it was a wet desert, because it was very difficult to cultivate, um, almost impossible to navigate, um, because the prairie grasses could be as much as eight feet tall, and their roots were nearly as deep. So to cultivate it, it was difficult to cultivate because the roots were so deep and, it, and of course you couldn't see through a sea of eight foot grass. They might not have been able to see through it, but the early settlers in Illinois managed to slowly change the sea of grass into small farms. These changes are told by the items they left. Well, you know, each artifact that, that we have represents a story. And that's what I love about the artifacts. And it's really interesting, the very first thing that people see when they come in is a bison skull. And people say, I had no idea we had bison here. Um, well, you, you wouldn't, because they're not here now. The environment that the original settlers found slowly changed, and so too did the people who moved here. We have some really early clocks, and one of the, there were only a few things that were taxed when, when um, Champaign became a county. One of them was your income, of course, um, your livestock, and your clocks. So that story alone tells you how, what a precious thing a clock was. The museum also pays tribute to a local lawyer who, too, was shaped by the land he grew up in. The man, Abraham Lincoln. We tried to tell the story of Lincoln particularly in Champaign County. Um, and I think his, his experience in Champaign County was typical. Lincoln was in Champaign County all of the years that he practiced on the, travel, on the Eighth Circuit. Um, he, he came to Champaign County. So he had a long time to make a lot of, you know, close acquaintances, people that he, he visited each time he came. And I think that helps a lot to humanize Lincoln it makes, uh, him, and makes us realize that there are people whose grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren still live here, work, work with us, that Lincoln knew. Lincoln is so respected that the museum takes pains to show the human side of our 16th president. You know, Lincoln was a, was a goofball. I mean, really, that's the way I feel about it. He, um, there was, was a hotel he stayed in in Urbana. Um, where uh, the proprietor woke everyone every morning with the breakfast gong, which rang at 6.30 or something like that. And um, it became increasingly annoying to the lawyers and to the judge because they didn't want to get up that early. They certainly didn't want to be awakened by a gong. So Lincoln, uh, with his friends, conspired to steal the gong. And, and he just, you know, they used to have those, those uh, slide out tops on tables, so he just, he just hid it underneath one of the tables in the dining room. The Museum of the Grand Prairie doesn't just tell the story of this place with artifacts. The museum sits next to a six mile long path that goes from woodland to prairie, just as the original settlers would have experienced it. Well, of course, the bike path um, 
is, is for us, a pur the purpose is to bring people through that environment and the land across from the museum, which is called Buffalo Trace, is being redeveloped into a prairie area and so it's an opportunity to get our audiences, whether they're walking, whether they're biking or whether they're rollerblading, uh, whether they're strolling with their children, to get them out into the environment and to learn about a sense of place, what this place was like. One is amazed with the variety of the path. Tall grasses, tiny ponds, small groves of trees. Birds are all over and deer have been known to move along the path. It helps the walker experience how small one can feel in the middle of a wet desert. But sometimes we forget about the impact of what we're doing has on the land and the landscape around us. And how do we use that environment so that we have a good life, but how do we give back so that we're not destroying that environment so generations to come, children, grandchildren, have this wonderful place to live as well. In Mount Vernon, Illinois, avid art collectors John and Eleanor Mitchell acquired a significant collection of 19th and 20th century American paintings and sculptures. Now upon their desk, they left their entire estate to the residents of Southern Illinois. Today, the Cedarhurst Center for the Arts offers year-round visual and performing arts for people of all ages. Mr. Mitchell's family was here. He grew up here, went to the University of Illinois. Um, Mrs. Mitchell came from Northern Illinois and came here to teach school. And she started the art and the PE department at the high school, at the Mount Vernon Township High School. And they met at a shooting club here in Mount Vernon. There's a little story about their meeting. She, someone introduced them and she said, oh, I met the most impertinent young man, but he obviously impressed her. Uh, and asked her out on a date, and um, it was history after that. John and Eleanor loved to travel all over the world. They also shared a deep love for art. In the 1940s and 50s, on their many adventures, the Mitchells began collecting American paintings. Went on some wonderful trips, African safaris into the interior of South America, and where they did some actually pretty dangerous, made some pretty dangerous trips. Uh, but they were a, an adventuresome couple. And then they went um, to Switzerland to ski and they sort of had a wonderful life. In the late 60s or in the middle 60s, they decided they wanted to have a museum to house their permanent collection. They had no children. And so they have left us this legacy of their exquisite permanent collection. But the Mitchells were never able to see their museum. Eleanor died in 1971, and John died right before groundbreaking. In November of 1973, the Cedarhurst Center for the Arts opened for residents of Southern Illinois and visitors from around the globe to come and enjoy the arts. They collected hundreds of objects during their lifetime, but the core of their collection or the, the, the most interesting objects in their collection today are the group of American paintings, works by Mary Cassatt, John Singer Sargent, Child Hassam, and there are probably upward of 30 to 35 of those major works by the signature figures of early American modern art history. About 440 paintings are in the Mitchell's permanent collection and one of the most significant works is the George Bellows, called Mrs. T in Wine Silk. That painting has appeared in virtually every Bellows retrospective since the artist died, in the, died prematurely in the 1920s. It's a very ambitious work, it's a large painting, and it's also sort of exquisitely quirky. The center holds not only the Mitchell's signature collection of American paintings, but also offers many other unique experiences. We also have concerts in here, chamber music series that's now in its 28th season. Uh, we have six or seven concerts a year for that. We have school performing arts programs, probably nine or ten a year. Um, we have dinner theater. We're not just about paintings, we, we do video, we do new media, we do ceramics, we do glass. We, we have a, we, a variety of things. 
Um, no, no medium is really off limits to us. We do at least a half dozen shows every year in this space, the main gallery of the Mitchell Museum. So exhibitions are rotating through here really almost every, every couple of months. We do another half dozen shows a year in our children's gallery, really fun exhibitions like the Ken Stark show we have right now, which is a project called Orphan Train, which um, is a group of paintings that were used as illustrations for, uh, for a book called Orphan Train. The exhibit on display the day we visited Cedarhurst was called Beyond the Hudson River. The 30 paintings on display came from Crest Royal Fine Art New York, a commercial dealer in New York City that holds one of the finest galleries today of American paintings. The Hudson River School basically spans the years from about 1825 to 1875. And it's important because it was America's first native-born tradition in the visual arts. Remember, America is very much about the land, and these painters were wonderful, wonderful landscape painters. And to a great degree, they were responsible for introducing the nation to its own great country, to its own destiny, in a sense, and to the marvel of its, of its own potential. One of the most popular exhibits is the Sculpture Park. The park sits on 90 acres of serene beauty and features many contemporary artist work. They range from very beautifully fabricated um, metal objects to these sort of monolithic monstrous stones that, um, that have been carved into you know, exciting abstract forms and, and it's a variety of interesting, interesting artists who are participating in our, in our program here. We own maybe half of the works in the park, the other half are here on loan and rotate in and out every couple of years. So the park never quite looks the same way on any two visits. This world-renowned sculpture park has as many as 50 to 60 works on display at a time. One of the most popular sculptures is called The Dancers by artist Martha Ensman. The dancers on the lake are particularly unique. Uh, there aren't that many floating sculptures uh, in the country, but we always tell this little story when people come that um, it, there's a male and a female, and he has this lasso up here, and he's trying to catch her because she floats by him all the time. But as far as I can tell, he has never gotten a hold of her. <laughs> It is so calm and peaceful to just sit there and, and it's a great place to, to eat your lunch on the bench, you know, just to sit there and watch that. A few years ago, we were chosen to be on the front of the Guide to Sculpture Parks and Gardens of America. And we've been very fortunate because that has actually brought us some notoriety. It is a very popular destination for travelers across the country. We get lots and lots of visitors who come simply to see this, the sculpture that's in this park and walk the absolute, absolutely gorgeous grounds that they appear in. With over 50,000 visitors annually, Cedarhurst is always offering new art collections and exhibits on display for visitors to enjoy. People feel um, that if they don't know anything about art, they, sh they should not go. And in fact, it's just quite the opposite. If you come, you may learn something about art, but you don't have to. There is, you know, there's no requirement. We, we don't do any testing on the way out. Um, we like people to come and enjoy it and, inf and just sort of feel the, just have the experience of viewing it. Having art in your life, whether it be music, uh, theater, or the visual arts such as we have here, um, opens up a new avenue for thinking, for getting those creative juices going. Admission to the Cedarhurst Center for the Arts is free, and they are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and on Sunday from 1 to 5 p.m. If you'd like to purchase a copy of any Heartland Highways program, contact us at 1-877-727-9348 during regular business hours. You can also visit our online store at weiu.net or mail your order with payment to the address on your screen. DVDs are available for $25 each. Visa, MasterCard, Discover, or American Express are accepted. 
just let us know what show you're interested in by mentioning the story name or the person featured in the show. Well, we hope you've enjoyed our museum tours today, and maybe you can find a museum near you to visit. Sounds good. Join us again next time for another edition of Heartland Highways. Mickey Mouse and many more. Many more. <laughs> many more. Three, two, one. In Muhammad, Illinois, the early... Come on, come on, come on, come on. This is not hard. Three. In Muhammad, Illinois, the museum... No, not the museum. Three. Doors, and hopefully you can... Blah, blah, blah. Hopity, hope, hope. Hopity, hopity, hope. Three. Okay. Is there a light coming out of my head? Yeah. Oh, yeah.